Welcome. This is Geek Gab Game Night for Thursday, February 21st, 2019. Uh, I'm your host, John, with my co host, the inimitable Daddy Warpig, as usual. Hey, Daddy Warpig, how are you doing? Um, let's just go with great. I'm doing great. Great. That's I'm what I'm going to tell everybody. I'm going to translate that for you today. He is alive, awake, and online. That's great. Uh, I just checked through those three things, and yes, all of those are still true. Excellent. Excellent. Well, please stick around. Uh, we love having you here. It's important for you to be alive, awake, and online for about the next hour. How's that sound? Sure. I think I arranged that with some people. So. All right. We're looking forward to it. Uh, so, you know who we're talking with tonight? Are you asking me the question? I'm asking you the question. Oh, because you could ask him the question. That'd be kind of interesting. Hey, I, I could introduce our guest, but let's let him introduce himself. We, uh, you know what? There's a rap tap tapping at my chamber door, so it looks like you're going to have to do the introductions. I'll be right back. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We're hanging out talking with, uh, with Douglas Cole. I think this is probably his third time on the show. Uh, he's been working really hard. Uh, uh, he came on a couple times for uh, the Dungeon Grappling expansion, which is sort of a, a system agnostic uh, RPG supplement. But but since then, he's been working really hard at expanding the GURPS uh, Dungeon uh, D&D setting. Uh, welcome to the show, Douglas Cole. Thanks for having me back again. I always uh, enjoy this. This is good good stuff. Always keep me on my toes. Yeah, uh, and, and you're doing such... You're doing interesting and slightly different stuff from what I see coming out from other uh, uh, publishers. So it's really fascinating to get your perspective on on uh, the games and the industry as well. So, so what uh, you, you shared you shared on your your blog and you shared with me the introduction to your new book. Uh, so before we actually get to the book, I, I want to point this out. Apparently. According to uh, the uh, the guys at Steve Jackson Games, you're single handedly reviving their uh, their dungeon fantasy setting. Is that true? To a certain extent, um, you know that's certainly what they said. the 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 dungeon fantasy role playing game was an attempt to take the toolkit that is GURPS and whittle it down as far as you can. Um, or as far as they chose to, I should say, uh, to facilitate dungeon crawl, kill monsters and take your stuff kind of play. Um, GURPS is a toolkit. It's a great toolkit, but it requires upfront work to make sure that the game that you're playing is the one that you want to play. And the Dungeon Fantasy role-playing game was an attempt to capture the spirit of old school dungeon crawling, plus some of the roguelike, you know, going around and killing things and taking their stuff and, and you know, getting better and better gear and, and, you know, basically your traditional dungeon crawling, um, but using the 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 more tactical engine um, that, that is GURPS. And, you know, it's a beautiful box set. It sells for, I think, $60 retail. It was available on Kickstarter for $50. Uh, it's a 10 inch by 10 inch by four inch box. The production values are really good, right? There are five soft cover books in there, some maps, whatever. Uh, but it costs a lot of money to make, I think. Yeah, and and it sounds like it would. And, and yeah, such such a low price point for for all the books. It it really it really is it really is. And I think what wound up happening is that while initial sales were good. They didn't take off the way that they needed to to recapture the staff time that had been invested in it. So they were like, you know, I we're gonna we're not gonna yank it. We're certainly gonna publish it, but we're not gonna reprint it. We're not gonna really double down on this one. Um, and at Gen Con fifty. Uh, in 2017, I was running for the first time, it hadn't been written yet, Lost Hall of Tear for 5th edition, um, and it also could be run in Swords and Wizardry. But I was running the adventure that would eventually uh, become that my second Kickstarter uh, to demonstrate the dungeon grappling system. 
and I was also there to play with Sean Punch, the line editor, uh, who we spoke to. Um, yeah, together, we had right. Yeah, we had, we had Sean Punch on the show last time you were here. Uh, yeah, um, and he's a he's a great guy. I love him to death. Uh, and I was playing in his game. I had paid for that backer level to actually meet him and play with him as the game master. Um, and I said to Steve, hey, you know, I've got a publishing company now. I've been writing for you since 2002. Um, I would like to talk about doing an adventure for you. And he says, you know, if this does okay, ask me again. Um, so then I went over to Phil Reed and I said, hey, Steve was really positive. He's like, Phil's like, please, God, don't blog about that. We're so not ready to announce anything like that. Um, and, but, you know, and, and it was, you know, natural conservatism, which is good in a businessman. Um, but in any case, it, push I, came to shove. And eventually I said, hey, is it time yet? I'd like to do this. And they're like, you know what? Yes, uh, let's let's do that. I had delivered a couple of Kickstarters earlier on time. Uh, my product, I, I had given uh, the staff some copies of Dragon Heresy and Dungeon Grappling. And so they knew that I was not putting together some stick figures uh they they knew that i could put something together and be an effective project manager nice proof, get a nice proof of concept there right exactly and, and dragon heresy was a big project um and uh you right. know so i was able to send them some pdfs and, and and lost hall had completed and so i was like i want to convert lost hall and here it is to the dungeon fantasy role-playing game and i want to do it bigger lost hall was 64 pages I want to expand it. And it wound up being a 128 page book. Uh, and wow. it did pretty well, right? I mean, it, it you know, five, 600 copies got sold and everyone who's played it and read it is like, wow, this is really good. And, 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 you know, yay, yay me. Right. But it was profitable because I had all that art from lost hall and dragon heresy. Uh, so I really only had to pay for uh, editing I, I was able to learn enough InDesign to do my own layout and, and using a template that I had used. Uh, so I was able to do that pretty much at, at low cost. Um, and it also allowed me to throw some money at things. I engaged Glenn Seal, who was the gold any award winner last year for cartography to make me some new maps. Um, you know, one of the feedbacks, which was correct about Lost Hall of Tear, was that it was pretty linear. And well, of course it was because it was a convention one shot. It was designed to show off grappling in, in two or four hours of time. I can't remember which. I think it was two hours. So it was basically, ooh, look, this is how grappling cannot suck in a two hour block of time. So, you know, yeah, it was very linear. It had, you know, you know, you've, I'm sure you've heard the phrase quantum ogre, right? Um, the encounters move so that you can experience these grappling intensive fights because it was a demo, not a hex crawl. But for Dungeon Fantasy role playing game, I wanted it to be more. So I was able to blow it out and it did really well. And so then I went back and said, hey, uh, and that was this was a game hall con. I sat down with him, I said, I'd like to do more. And I, I was actually sitting with Steve and he's like, yeah, we can make that happen. So, so you're, you know? you're doing more and, and what are you doing now? What have you done, man? I okay. want to do this so the audience knows, because they may not know Steve Jackson. Um, and this is just as an outsider looking in at GURPS and the products uh, and how his company has been run. A lot of people come into this business and they're all creative and stuff, but they have no business sense. But Steve Jackson uh, seems to be really hard-nosed about the business and make uh, well-informed and um, solid decisions. And he's managed to keep his company floating when I don't know if there's anybody of his contemporaries when he started publishing who have actually survived without being taken over or bought out or gone through a bankruptcy or whatever. I don't know if there's anybody who's survived. There are two or three, but I, I actually don't remember their names. He he told me the two names of the people who are actually still alive in an interview I did with him years ago, but I can't pull them to memory. Um, but yes, there are very few who have not gone under. And 
you know, if you ever interview Steve, you'll find that he answers a lot of questions almost as a hostile witness because he doesn't want to ever overcommit. I know that he made that mistake once or twice early in his career, and he is absolutely convinced he will never promise something that he can't deliver again. And and that has rubbed off on me because um, I got my writing start with Steve Jackson Games uh, writing for Pyramid since 2002. So I've absorbed some of, of what they do and how they think about that uh, and how I approach my business activities. So uh, back to your question, uh, John. Yeah, well, <laughs> I didn't what know. What are you doing now? That was the question. That was the question. Say, so I didn't. I'm. I didn't know that about Steve Jackson. Um, Steve Jackson Games uh, is. Uh, I'm not. I've never been a big follower of them. I'm not a Munchkin player. I'm not a GURPS player, as as established on prior episodes. Uh, so so that's all. That was all news to me. That's actually pretty fascinating. But yeah, yeah. It, but you're you've done something new, something great and terrible, and and now you're back. So what's what's new with you? That's correct. So the last time we talked, it was talking about, uh, um, I think it was Hall of Judgment. And, and since then, the hard copies of Hall of Judgment, uh, Dragon Heresy have come out. And now I just started two days ago a Kickstarter for a expansion of the setting that is found in Dragon Heresy and Hall of Judgment. Um, but it's really blowing out an area of the map. Uh, along the inevitable wall between the wilds of the north and, and the realm. Um, you know, when, when, when my fake Vikings need to build a wall to keep out bad stuff, you know it's really bad stuff. But it's called the Citadel at Nordborn, and it's a look at three towns um, in, in, along this region, which is 250 miles basically due east of where Lost Hall of Tier Hall of Judgment took place, uh, and in a in a city and a pair of towns, um, and something has happened that has riled the area up, and then other things happen to rile it up more. And this is a setting; it's not a adventure where you have to go find the unholy Grail of of Warpig. It, it's a mesh of interacting threads and you can't shake a stick in this area without plucking some of those strings and that's going to make some people want to kill you and some people want to help you and, and, and we're putting that in now right uh, is there is there a backer level for adding uh, a new magical artifact the uh, the evil war pig artifact you know i think there needs to be um you know, I, I want to make sure that I can deliver, like we, like you said, uh, well, or we haven't said that yet, but you know, like we were talking, you know, I, I, I never launch a Kickstarter until I'm almost done with the writing. Usually, I'm very done, um, and and for this one, there have been other developments in my publishing career, so to speak, which are very exciting, um, but I need to make room for them. Steve Jackson Games, when I sat down with them at Gamehole Con. You know, I was like, look, you know, I really want to follow up and I'm really glad that uh, you let me do this adventure and I hope that you'll let me do more. And they said, yeah, let's do that. I was like, is there anything that I can do that I'm not already doing? And Steve looks at me and says, do some fantasy trip stuff. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me take that under advisement because I don't know the fantasy trip. I've never played it. That was not part of my... Uh, introduction to gaming um you're you're gonna have to me on that a fantasy trip the fantasy trip it was it started with uh, two small box games melee and wizard um and then got built out into a a larger role-playing type game instead of a tactical combat uh uh game uh uh called in the labyrinth and the whole piece i think it was uh metagaming back when steve jackson games was working for somebody else uh, and it was the whole system was called the Fantasy Trip TFT, um, and it is very clearly the genetic ancestor of GURPS. Uh, so when Steve left the fan, uh, left metagaming, I think uh, the rights to what he had developed stayed with that company, so he couldn't use them. And so he developed GURPS 
as a next step beyond that. Um, but you can very clearly see it in the DNA. But it's a very simple, you know, your your character. It's a, it's an old school system, uh, melee and wizard. Uh, there's only a couple attributes. Uh, your characters easily exist on a three by five card, um, and, and it's a fairly realistic combat crawl that was designed. Uh, in as somewhat a reaction to things that Steve, who had experience with the SCA, didn't much like about how D&D combat worked. Um, and so he wrote a game, and then he wrote more games, and then he wrote GURPS. Um, but anyway, the fantasy trip was kickstarted as, oh, let's bring this back a little bit. Um, and it just went crazy. Uh, I can see. I just brought up the page. They, uh, they're, it looked like they're trying to fulfill orders right now. And, that's correct. And, and the Kickstarter ended where they got over three thousand backers and over three hundred thousand dollars to bring. That's correct. That's correct. And the, this box set is even bigger. I've seen it. I've seen the the mock up box. It's even bigger than the ten by ten by four Dungeon Fantasy role playing game box. And they've learned so much about running tight Kickstarters since the Ogre problem. And then with the Dungeon Fantasy role-playing game, they've learned so much about that that it was a really tightly run Kickstarter. Everything was planned in advance, and they, they weren't like, oh, we'll add a stretch goal. Well, they did add lots of stretch goals, but all of them were planned in advance. You can tell. You can tell. They always knew what was coming next. And as they knocked him down, uh, they were like, and we've got three more at, that could come up if you do well. And, hey, look, there's more. That's something that I'm not ready to do yet because it's just me. I don't have a staff. Uh, and some of the things that they can do with dice and miniatures and stuff like that. Um, oh, sure, yeah, because they've got yeah. a game production company, including all their suppliers that they can work with. Right. That is, and, and that's something that sinks so many kickstarters is creators getting far more money than they thought they were and then they start making up uh stretch goals on the fly correct and even people who price it out and think that they're doing something that's still going to be profitable that they can produce something new that's cool and it'll still be profitable when you're doing something you're planning something for a couple of months you have a lot of time to look at additional options or to, you know, if once, if you find a new supplier who will cut their, you know, costs, or if there's just too much trouble with this product, you, you don't produce it at all. But if you're doing it on the fly during a Kickstarter, you don't have the time to research it out to get, you know, all your ducks in a row financially, and you're spending all your time on your Kickstarter. And so you don't have, you know, you have just like, seconds a day to spend on everything else yeah i i agree completely and the other thing that i think most people don't always wrap their arms around is uh if you're gonna do it affordably a lot of times you're doing it overseas and the shipping to bring things that are not books across customs borders uh can be ruinous sending books out of the u.s to the rest of the world you know like dragon heresy is is 3.1 pounds um you know nice stout hardback 288 pages good paper blah 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 uh for me to ship a copy of dragon heresy to england from the u.s it's like 50 to, it's like 50 bucks the book itself is 50 bucks um if i would go into stamps.com i could get an exact price but it's not that important um uh, who was it? That, oh, uh, a Frog God. Frog God Games just ran into this because people were complaining about having to pay like seventy dollars shipping for a fifty dollars book or a hundred dollars shipping for a seventy dollars book. It was costing people more in shipping than the pledge because of the way it works. Now, I believe that I have cracked that. I'm. I think I'm one of the few, but in a way, it's because I'm small that I can get away with that. Um, and we can go into that later if you want. But in any case, Steve says to me, write the fantasy trip. And I say, let me think about it. And then I watch a few other things happen. And I go to a couple friends of mine. And I'm like, hey, you guys are already writing adventures for the fantasy trip, aren't you? And they're like, yes. I'm like, how would you like to write some for me? Actually, one person came to me and said, 
I've got more adventures that I can write than I think SJG is ready to publish. Do you think that you'd be interested in doing this? And so I said, hey, remember at Game Hole, you guys said, do you want to do this? I said, I've got a couple authors who I think would do it. And this was right after Pyramid Magazine got canceled. And there were authors who oh, used so Pyramid to eat, frankly. Um, and so it was one of those things where I'm like, you know, we've got something here. And I did the math and I, cause I always do the math and I'm like, you know, I think we can do this. And Phil's like, send me a real proposal. And so I sent him a real proposal, uh, you know, with numbers and pitches and this is what I'm going to do. And here's how I'm going to try and fund it. And they came back and they said, yeah, we'll just use the same contract that we used for Dungeon Fantasy. And as long as you continue to produce good stuff crunch all you want so in the next 12 months i should be releasing no fewer than 10 16 page adventures for the fantasy trip oh that's great so not only do i have three including the one i'm kickstarting now dungeon fantasy role-playing game licenses from from uh phil and steve and steve jackson games I have a minimum of 10 pre-approved 16 pagers um, that are, two of them are actually within a week of being done um, from, by the authors. I'm not writing those. I'm, I'm project manager on those, and, and that's a role that I love. Well, um, well uh, for, if, to poke fun, that of course you're not writing them because they're only coming in at 16 pages. Oh, God. But, you know, the funny thing about that is, yeah, I do like to write. Um, and I like to be wordy and, and then I cut it down and then I write and whatever. But I'll tell you what, that 16 page, uh, page count, uh, 16 pages is the perfect size. If you want to be, uh, a good going concern, I probably shouldn't have said that out loud, but it, it's a single 16 page signature which means if it's offset print, you get maximum efficiency. Um, it's a great price point. A well-produced 16 pager is going to sell for about 10 bucks. Um, maybe as much as 12, but I, but I'm not going to do that. Right. But a, a good 10, 16 page adventure is going to be about $10. And that's something that people will spend, right? You know, if you throw it out, you know, 50 is something you have to think about a hundred or 150, uh, for the three D&D core books, you have to think about that. Uh, $10 is a couple of coffees. You can like, all right, fine. I can do that. Right. That I don't want to be, I don't want to be dismissive of anything where people are like, no, you know, I need that $10 and it's a hard decision for me because it's true. Right. Um, but by and large, $10 is something that most people will look at and say, yeah, okay, I can do this. Um, that used to be the whole business, right? I mean, people, people would just get, you know, they'd subscribe to Dragon Magazine and they'd get all these, uh, all the small adventures. That's uh, right. That's even, right. Even as recently as uh, the original uh, Pathfinder, the first edition of Pathfinder, Paizo Pi started as an adventure printing company. You know, and, and 16 pages is about 8,000 words. I, can, I mean, you can be more than that, but, you know, 16 pages, at least for me, is 8,000 to 8,500 words, and that's enough to develop. That's a, that's a solid that's a solid little bit, especially in a system like the Fantasy Trip, which doesn't have a fifth edition or GURPS's one page per monster stat block. Right, so when you've got a BX or an Axe or uh, or Swords and Wizardry or the Fantasy Trip, which is just something that you can write down the needed stats for a monster in a little like you know one inch by two inch box, you don't need a ton of room to have a really cool adventure. So, you know, you wind up with a couple of maps, uh, a couple of pieces of art, uh, and a lot of adventure that goes on and it's something that you can play through and you know i it it really looks like i'll tell you what the next year is going to decide whether gaming ballistic is a real publishing company or if it's just a hobby 
or if it's my hobby and well you you do i mean you are running the numbers and you're actually trying to make it a business so I am. so so that you you've got that over every one of us who's just you know a lot of gamers are writing their own thing or making their own system or something like that. And, and often it's a labor of love or, 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 a, or a hobby or something like that. Right. And, right. And, and you know, and I'm a PhD R and D engineer, right? I mean, for me to replace my day job means that I have to be one of them, one of the most successful independent publishers out there because I don't do poorly. Um, Right. But for me to say, you know, I'm just going to, you know, the old joke is if you want to make a small fortune in game publishing, start with a much larger fortune and work down. <laughs> <laughs> and and obvious. And it's and, you know, there's a lot of truth to it. Right. I mean, I, I was profitable in 2018 and I have a blog post where for anyone who cares, I, I, I break down uh, all of my my successes and failures uh, financially with numbers, right? So I don't hide what it is, but you know, if I were to try and live on my 2018 profits, it's $8,000 or $7,000 for the entire year. And, and uh, I, gotta, I gotta admit that, and you, you have all that blog, all that blog on gaming ballistic, right? I do. And, and, and those are the blog posts that I sort of, I pay more attention to when you're actually doing the business stuff. I and mean, oh, that's how that breaks down. It's sort, of, it's sort of interesting to not just talk about whatever cool monsters and magical items that you're doing. It, yeah, you know, and, and I have no problem talking about it. Usually when I'm doing something that really uh, sparks my fancy, and at least in terms of my fun posts, it, it tends to be firearms and stuff. Um, and one day, Gaming Ballistic will publish something that has to do with guns. It's not all going to be swords and spells. Um, I even have a couple of ideas. Um, but uh, and, and a finally a long delayed product that uh, has been kind of waiting in the wings, maybe coming up close to, uh, to to being ready in the next year as well. So there might even be a full game again, not written by me. Um, that. Uh, that might appear on the scene depending on, on how things are going. Um, but uh, in any case, I thought um, your post about bows and arrows was just a trip. I loved it. <laughs> uh, which one was that? Uh, where you referenced your article in, in pyramid. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was an interesting article. It started with, there was a play test that I was on the GURPS low tech play test where I was really not happy with the way that bows were being presented. I'm like, I think we can do better. And I was like, you know, I did guns in 2,500 words, surely bows would be easier. And it turns out it's really hard. Um, and so 11,000 words later, uh, and, and it got me another mention in TV tropes and because my nasty transcendental equation table, um, because it turns out that when you're bending a bow, the math gets really hard. Um, yeah. But uh, beyond that, it was it was fun. And every now and then, someone was like, you know, you didn't get this exactly right. I'm like, yes, I know. I did not get that exactly right. You know why? You need a freaking supercomputer to get it exactly right. Because um, you can't solve it analytically. But I digress. Um, but yeah, the bow and arrow article is fun. I used to do a series called uh, uh, Gun Day. Monday is Gun Day. Or maybe Sunday is Sunday, um, where I would break down in D and D and group stats different cartridges um, for for people who like to be obsessively detailed about that sort of thing. So um, uh, I'm about to ask you a big question. Yeah, go. Um, and but before before we hit the big question, I just want to remind the uh, audience that we have a link to the Citadel at Nordholm, uh, Nordvum, excuse me. Uh, Kickstarter in the bottom underneath the video and his blog, which you absolutely ought to check out. I've read quite a lot of it. Um, and uh, both those links are in the description of the video right now. Um, so this is my query, and I don't want to verge too far off into the weeds of, uh, of subjects that we generally avoid here on the show. Um, 
but I think it's an interesting uh, question for people getting into the business right now. Hmm. It seems like the same um, creator fan, uh, I don't want to use the word toxicity, but I can't think of a good word right now, so I'll use the terrible word. Uh, creator fan toxicity where you know marvel artists and writers and editors will personally insult their fans uh telling them to f off and calling them all sorts of of, of really nasty names and that's happening in uh american uh import american anime licensors who bring anime in from overseas people who uh, translate video games uh, it's happening in the movie industry where there's a really confrontational attitude between creators and the people who are paying their paychecks to where they're telling them essentially, you know, get lost. I don't want you to to be, I don't want you to give me money. I don't want your money. Um, and it seems like a couple of game companies have started heading that way. In every other industry and hobby where this has happened, the business of those companies gets, you know, drops off and they go broke. Um, and so my prediction or my analysis of the current trends in the RPG industry is that we're going to start seeing these really vociferously, you know, outspoken anti-fan creators start going downhill uh, or, or start having more and more business troubles because it doesn't take a lot of trouble uh, to cause a lot of trouble for a role-playing company. Um, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if you agree with my analysis or not, or if you agree with my premise or not, or if you agree with the facts that I, I uh, perceive or not, but it seems to me like that might be an opportunity for fan-friendly, hard-working indies to get a larger share of the market because people will like them and buy their stuff or they won't buy stuff from bigger companies anymore. They've just been insulted too much. So I can understand why it's verging into topics that you don't want to talk about on the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what I would say is, you know, I, uh, I am happy to work side by side and play games with anybody. Um, I'm trying to write what I enjoy and expose people to areas of culture that I am learning and, and historical medieval uh, uh, culture and methods of thinking about the world. You know, plus killing things and taking their stuff because it is a game steeped in that. Although you can do more, clearly you can do more. Um, I, I, the, you know, I'm a really small publisher. The most copies of anything that I've sold is around 600. Um, I think that's about what I did for Dungeon Grappling. It's probably what GURPS Martial Arts Technical Grappling sold, and it's about what. Uh, oh, I am, I am. Sorry, I am thirty-six dollars away from halfway to my goal. Uh, awesome. some, some, somebody just made a, a, a nice hefty pledge. Um, but in any case, um, you know, I, from a strictly pragmatic standpoint, um, I right. can't afford to insult anybody. From a personal standpoint, I don't want to. You know, I, I. I don't, I, I am a flawed, struggling, some gifted, some problems like every other human on this planet. And I don't have a leg to stand on. I'm not going to tell anybody that, you know, they're playing elf games wrong. Um, and that's just not where I am. You know, it's a big world and we can all do our thing. And I, I just really hope that people will see what I do and, and like it um, and gain some of the passion. And, and where, where I like the, the Viking stuff, you know, I was not like a raw, raw Nordic guy. I mean, my mom's last name is Cohen, right? I'm not, I'm not 
someone who's got this immense Teutonic ancestry, um, despite my mother's opinion of my new haircut. Um, I, I, uh, I, you know, I went to learn about how to use a shield and found out that how people make artifacts with 1000 AD or 700 AD technology is really interesting, right? I'm a material science PhD. So I do high volume electronics manufacturing. I'm a process guy. Um, you know, I understand about 6061 T6 and, uh, you know, tie 1311 three alloys and, you know, that kind of vacuum forming and ballistics and penetration and, and, you know, uh, surface science and blah, 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 material stuff. It's awesome. You should major in it. Go to Rice um, or Northwestern. Um, there's my pitch uh, for my alma maters. But, uh, right, so that's the stuff. But when you sit down and the way that you make a shield, uh, and I do make these Viking shields and I'm getting better at it every day, but if you need to make a shield and your first step is to go out and cut down a damn tree with an ax, and by the way, they didn't have a sawmill, so you have to use wedges to split it and then use more axes to rive it into planks. Uh, and then you have to boil an animal to get glue or mix vinegar with milk to make uh, casein glue, uh, milk glue. And you do all this stuff and you skin animals and you have this thing that you can hit with a two-handed ax. And it's only like eight, nine millimeters thick, but it'll take it. It's amazing. Thane Thrand and his YouTube channel does this amazing test where he's replicated one of the Gokstad shields and he beats the hell out of this thing with a two handed Dane axe and it takes it. And this is a seven pound shield. It's light. And our ancestors weren't stupid. And that's one of the things that I really am trying to convey in this Viking ish Norse inspired setting is, is, the sense of culture and the sense of different beliefs and honor that they would have and how clever they were. Plus throw fireballs. Cause why not? Um, but it, that's just kind of what I'm trying to get across. And, and, and there's some of that in what I'm doing and it makes it really fun for me. And so I hope people pick up on the fun to get there. But I, guess, I guess that's my answer to the question is, is that, you know, I, I think that, I've failed enough in my life because of my own failings. I don't need to find problems with other people and make fun or yell or curse them or whatever. Kind of my, my thesis is that this is a fourth edition Paizo moment for other players in the industry now. In that fourth edition came out, ticked off a lot of D&D &D fans, and Paizo basically ran third edition, scooped a large part of them up. Uh, and then there are others who fled to the OSR and things like that. But they made their bones on uh, Wizards of the Coast's screw-ups. And now it looks like a, a several large players are about to piss off their fan bases for different reasons. And I, I'm seeing kind of a, a market opportunity, I guess, uh, to move in and try to get pick up some of those fans. You know, I, I guess I am always happy to have people buy my stuff. Um, I, I think consciously making that play is going to anger as many people as it picks up. So it, it's it's I, I, I that's not something. You know, I, I I really don't feel like bringing the culture wars to my living room. I just don't. I don't need to. And I don't think that the, my friends who come from all sides of the political spectrum want me to. And, you know, I'm happy to have great conversations with all sorts of folks. And, you know, it, it, there may be, an, you know, from so I would separate that side of thing from, I think, what happened with fourth edition, which kind of got back to D&D's wargaming roots a little more than than people liked. Uh, and Paizo was there to pick up the ball and run with it. Um, you know, I think that for people who like Pathfinder and 3.5, uh, I played the Pathfinder 2.0 playtest at Gamehole, and I liked it. 
uh, there were some really clever things there that um, uh, I thought that they did well. Um, you know, I, I think that some of what they're doing you can find in Dragon Heresy, and it would be awfully fun if 0.001% of those people would buy that book. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. for me, right, I mean, it's funny. Um, for me to make a living, like a real honest to God publisher living off of Dragon Heresy only, which is a terrible business plan, but let's pretend. Yeah, I would probably need to sell three or four, maybe far, yeah, maybe three to 5,000 books a year, which is probably a partial print run for any of these big dogs, right? I mean, the, the, the number of copies for me just being me to sell to change my life radically uh, is so far different than these big companies, right? Um, so, you know, if there's some people who are like, oh, well, you know, I want some more deadly combat or I like fifth edition, but I hate the short rest or, you know, I'm a big fan of shields and shields aren't good in any system. Although I'll, I'll admit that Pathfinder 2.0 and the dragon heresy, both, you can do really cool things with shields. Um, but you know, if, if some of those people want to pick up my book, you know, it's in stores. Um, and that's actually from from a business perspective. If I can step sideways, one of the challenging things that I'm uh, um, uh, seeing is that one of the things that I need to do is figure out how to get my name in front of retailers. Yeah. Um, because that's that's not, it's it's you need to sell a lot more copies because you know selling into distribution is is definitely not direct retail and it's really not direct to customer. But, you know, if you can get somebody saying, oh, gee, you know, I mean, God, if Target or Barnes and Noble said, you know, I'd really like to have one of these in my stores, you know, you're doing a print run just for them. Um, and that kind of that kind of volume, boy, that that would make it so that I uh, could do a lot more pre-work before I go to market with the Kickstarter. I like being done, right? When I launch my Kickstarter, I like basically, oh, here's the art, and here's some layout, and here's this. I have some of that for Nordvorn, but not as much as I prefer. Um, and boy, if with a, a little bit more uh, money coming in from some retail sales and, and distribution sales, that would help. And I, I you know, I've got, uh, um, you know, 50 or 60 books that got sold in January through distribution. So, you know, that's, that was really awesome for me. That's going to be, um, a great way to pre-invest in like five or six pieces of art for Nordborn when that check comes in. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Did, so do we want to jump into your thing, John? Uh, well, just really quick. I wanted to respond to, to what you were saying, Daddy Warpig. I think, uh, I, I don't think the opportunity is going to be that big. May, uh, I, may, I may be taking a leap here, but I'm going to go on record saying that I think, uh, obviously, the elephant in the room is Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro with the Dungeons & Dragons brand. Uh, I think I think what they're doing is going to work. I think their transition from just a game into a lifestyle, you know, the, the lifestyle brand, the thing that the RPG pundit keeps railing at. I th so I think, yeah, it's going to create some small opportunities for people looking for a good quality game. Uh, where uh, adventure publishers, indie publishers, that sort of thing, they're going to be able to, they're going to capture some of that. But as far as the the game's stranglehold on on the um, on the zeitgeist, I think I don't think that's going away. I think Dungeons and Dragons is still going to be the name brand, uh, and and for for no other reason than the players don't know any better. Just like the uh, the OSR crowd, like the Jeffro Johnsons of the world, uh, sort of pointing and 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 at the old school games and saying, hey, look, there's there's other things you can do at the table uh, that are just as fun, if not more fun, than what you're doing with Dungeons and Dragons. But uh, I think it's I think it's gonna stay a niche. And one dominated by Watsi. That's my that's my take. I, I I would tend to agree. One of the reasons that Dragon Heresy well there's two reasons Dragon Heresy is based on fifth edition. Uh, one is that it really is a good game engine. Very modular. You can strip it down and play it old school. You can expand it out and have as much complexity as you want. Um, and because of the class level system, it's not as front-loaded as GURPS. You can do the exact same thing with GURPS. You can play it as simple as you want. 
uh, you can play it as complex as you want. Um, but with GURPS and the, even to some smaller extent, the Dungeon Fantasy role-playing game, it's front-loaded. Right? Unless you're playing with a pre-gen character, you got to make your guy. And it's not roll 4d6, drop lowest, or roll 3d6 in order if you're a purist. It's, okay, pick a template and allocate these points and stuff. And it's not like, uh, well, the fantasy trip. I, I'm at, got, yeah, I'm at yeah, the right? I'm at the yeah. point where if it takes more than five minutes to create a character, you've lost me. Right, exactly. And and there are people who really want to invest in the creation of the character. And, and for those people, uh, GURPS in the Dungeon Fantasy role-playing game is great. Uh, there are people who will spend five minutes writing up a D&D character and then spend five days writing up their backstory. Um, and it. Right? And, 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 you, and, and that can be a thing, for me at least, uh, in Dragon Heresy, I think I had to say explicitly, uh, your story starts when the game starts. Yeah, you may have a background, but the most important thing about the background is why you left it. Why is it that you're going to go out and try and get killed and eaten in the wilds when you why could be a smith or something else, right? What drew you there? Risk certain death, exactly. Right, but but beyond that, what I ask people, and I, I had to cut this, but one of the things, there are a couple things in Dragon Heresy. I really like the back. I looked at 140 different published backgrounds for 5e and filled them down into 20 archetypes, uh, of which I published four. So if I ever do more, there's a character's book that's waiting in the wings there that, that will be a lot of fun. Um, but in any case, the... Uh, why did you start? You know, where did you come from is an excellent question. Uh, actors ask that, uh, actor studios ask that of actors when they're playing a role, right? Where is it that you came from? You need to know so because that, that inform who you who you were informs who you are and informs who you're going to be. Um, and, yeah, exactly. right. So yeah, that but, makes sense. Well, right. I and then you want to know what is it that you're getting into adventuring to do? Are you going to impress a girl? Are you looking to be the richest man on the planet? Are you trying to buy your child out of debt slavery? I, 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 I get that, but I think I, I think you're hitting on the thing that I don't like about modern gaming, which is the lack of a default goal. I mean, in 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 uh, you know original, let's say BX, you've got. Gold gets you XP, which gets you your levels, and most characters like uh, want to own a piece of land or have a stronghold or something like that. Like, right. it, there's there's a baseline. Right, and, and, and in Dragon Heresy, I just want to jump into being narcissistic for a minute. In Dragon Heresy, that is very much the point, is you want to be the mightiest Viking on life. And King Krail is that, okay, for the first time in a thousand years, I'm opening up the ranks of nobility to anyone who can be mighty enough and rich enough to pay the duty. But the only place I'm opening up this new land is in the north, which, by the way, belongs to the dragonborn, dragonkin, and the fairy, and the you know the evil fae, and stuff like that. So you're going to have to go out and, and conquer. Um, and, and to that extent, it's and that's a very Norse Viking attitude, uh, I think. Um, uh, that you know, my, you know, who dares wins to borrow a borrow a motto and and stuff like that. Um, but I very much want very much wanted there to be a purpose to the delving, and that purpose was uh, to be a social climber, effectively, um, and to get that power and to stabilize the region and that and that kind of uh, that kind of thing. So I'm right there with you on that. I, I guess the point of the, uh, the the you know, and the point of that is that you know the. Why is it that you're adventuring and what will make you stop? And what make you stop? Maybe, hey, I have a castle and I'm a Jarl. Yeah. Now it's up to my my descendants to to improve the holdings and to maintain them and all that stuff. Now, now speaking of the Viking setting, this is a segue worthy of Daddy Warpig. Uh, we haven't actually talked much about your new your new setting, the castle at uh, their citadel at Nordvord. It's in that same Viking setting. It is, and and it's it's a total it's a source book for an area. So it's not a, a bunch of adventures. It's it's a place with hooks for adventures and stories. That that is correct. And and I ran uh, at game no. Uh, what did I do? Oh yeah, I know it was a playtest when I was playtesting Dragon Heresy and doing the Kickstarter. Um, I drew up uh, a mind map. 
if you're familiar with those. It's a network of interactions. And I started with the spider, what I call the Spider-Man hypothesis. Uh, the first Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie, like any good story, it's all about a girl. So I said, okay, let's go Romeo. It worked for Romeo and Juliet. It worked for Homer. It worked for Shakespeare. Right? It worked for Shakespeare. It worked for Homer. It worked for Spider-Man. It's going to work for me. So I started with a guy and a girl want to get married, but they can't. Well, why not? What's the worst reason that you can think of? And, and then I spiraled that out on both sides. And well, why would the girl not marry the guy even though they want to? Well, clearly dad says no, um, because, you know, I have two daughters, so I'm the evil dad. Um, and, and so why would dad say no? Well, okay. And that's how that builds out. And it goes all the way out that way. And then, well, once dad says no, he makes the other, the, uh, the, the boy's father really angry because he couldn't just say no. He had to publicly say no and, oh, this guy absolutely is not worthy of my daughter. Well, all right, that's a feuding situation. You besmirched the honor of me and my entire clan, right? Well, what could make that worse? Well, okay, okay, okay. Well, then the son says, I'm going to go out into the north and follow the king's command and I'm going to start a village and prove that I'm worthy. And then he goes off and gets himself killed and eaten. And, and so you've got this... And then there's spider web cracks from all of that. Well, why did that happen? What made this happen? Let's throw in a little spicy sex in there. Um, and, you know, because not only is the yard, you know, because not only did the son die, but the mom was visiting. And so the father is grief stricken. And so he's vulnerable. And so what can happen there? Well, that's an opportunity for political maneuvering. And so there's all this stuff. And when I ran it, when I ran the game with just that relationship map, I played for four or five hours with nothing prepared and I didn't need it prepared because the players were plucking these strings and you're like, Oh, well you're plucking this string. So that means these guys are going to try and kill you. Now you're plucking this string. So that means this person going to try and help you. Right. Well, what's going to happen there? Well, now there's going to be a fight. Well, that screws up the trade lines. Right. Uh -huh. so that's great. Yeah, that's classic. Like in a dungeon, you you make sure that if you if it's a large dungeon, you have multiple factions. That's right. And there are no fewer than four factions. And even within any one faction, like let me bring up uh, uh, how are we doing on time here? We got about what, eight minutes. Yeah, we're, we're about out of time. We'll go a little bit over because I wanted to talk to ask you guys like a, a hypothetical dungeon master question. Right, 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 right. So let me. Uh, where is it? Uh, no, no. Citadel trial. There we go. But, but um, this this is your Kickstarter. Say what you say what you need to. Yeah. So so if I go down to the town of Einferl, which means Riverbend, um, there's the Jarl, and he's struggling. Uh, he's the Jarl is the the son, the dead son's dad, and the Jarl has a uh, Hera. A Hera is like a lower noble. Um, you've got Riddars, which are like knights. You've got Heras, which are like the owner of or the the manager of several towns. Jarls, which are, you know, five to seven Heras, and then High Jarls, High Jarl, High Lords, which are like cities, right? And they've got all these resources. And all of this is based on real world farming and productivity numbers and a hefty uh, dose of Alex Macris's Adventure Conqueror King, because he did all the work, <laughs> right? If you want to build a self consistent world, go to Axe, because it's awesome. Um, so a combination of real world numbers that reinforce the work that Alex did as well. Um, so I've got this town and here's a, here's a high Jarl who's got a bunch of mining villages and she has interests. And here's a guy who's a, 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 a ranch, a, a, a shepherd, right? He's a, a grazing guy, but he's really tough as nails. And he's a raider. He raids and kills things. And, and it's almost a state of open war. And when the, political grip in that town starts to break down bad things start to happen and everyone is has their own self-interest and one of the things i'm doing literally right now is is the writing that i'm doing is how are what are each of these people's strategic goals what will they do as these different strings are pulled and every faction has a write-up about what it is they're trying to do um what are their strategic goals? What are the strategic weaknesses? And I'm actually using uh, a framework by General McChrystal. The McChrystal Group has a, a business framework 
uh, you know, uh, goals, methods, and motivations. What are you willing, you know, strategy is what it is that you need. Tactics are how you get it. And so I'm trying to use that framework to make sure that each of these factions is, is something that the game master can improvise. Right. As, 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 as the as players as muck it up. As, as long as they know sort of the lay of the land, who controls what and, and what resources they can bring to bear. Yep. Either, either for or against the the players and then you you've got a framework that any game master can use that's really that's really helpful right it's effectively a, almost a hex crawl but with a it's a social hex crawl but you know it's not just oh i went into this hex and and a uh, uh an owlbear attacks me um it's i go into this social situation and here's all the complications and you've got potential allies but don't piss off your allies and whatever it's, so it, it, it should be really interesting and it's not something that the dungeon fantasy role-playing game has attempted to do it's more that's been more of a uh, a combat delving focused game so it's a bit of a risk but it it, it, it so I, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing a lot of interesting stuff about what happens when the players begin interacting with the system, but uh, what are you doing to get the players? Is there anything there that the player characters want? Is there, uh, you know, if I'm going to drop this into my game, uh, this this citadel into my game, is there are there treasures to be found? Are there uh, so there are definitely stuff. There's basically going to be a whole bunch of stuff north of the wall, so to speak, because you got to go north of the wall um, to to do. There's the the whole region north of there is one giant treasure trove, right? It, it's where the former dragon empire was because you have to have a dragon empire. Uh, but that empire collapsed for reasons that we won't go into. Uh, but there's magic items and treasure and the wealth of nations left stagnant. And so there is definitely a reason to pass through that area. And the... the, uh, but, the well, that makes it... I, I mean, not... Uh, I'm challenging you because it, because it sounds like this is an excellent headquarters. If all the treasure is outside of the walls, what, why are the, uh, why would, why would I need to interact with the module at all? Uh, well, cause you have to get through the wall for one thing. So you're going to have to pass through either Nordborn or Longbrew to, to get through the wall. Um, and cause that's where the gates are. Um, and if you want to equip yourself for survival, you're going to have to do the shopping trip. And that's again, Long Brew or uh, Long Brew means Long Bridge. So you're either at the Long Bridge or North Watch to, uh, to do that. Um, and so there are reasons to pass through um, and uh, adventurers will be sought out and, and poked uh, because one of the interesting things is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the situation is fragile, but balanced. No one is clearly going to win. Uh, because of other things that are drawing away adventurer types into other activities that are north and west of this area. So as free agents come in, they're going to be approached with job op opportunities. So, okay. yeah, okay. so it's, it's more of a situation of, yeah, they can go through and shop, but if they get, begin adventuring beyond the, the walls, they may... Uh, I, I catch the attention of one or more of the local. Yes. And, and, and so there's all kinds of ways of doing that. The one that I recommend is as you're coming into town, uh, it's the Dashiell Hammett, you know, two mobsters come in and start shooting at you with guns, right? You walk in, you're coming up to one of these towns and a, a merchant caravan or your own party is attacked by fairy and that shouldn't be happening on this side of the wall period um and you know goblins or trolls or whatever and presumably the players will defeat them uh or they'll see it right? and another thing you know you're sailing up the river and one ship tries to raid another and that really quote unquote i mean it happens but it shouldn't happen that close to the city so there's all kinds of ways where you're going to get asked, well, you saw this, what happened? Or, oh, you managed to fight off these raiders, or you managed to survive, or hopefully you managed to survive. Um, and, and so that's going to bring you to the attention of people who are going to want to use you for their own thing. That could be, a, right, you know, if, if, a, if a fort, you know, if, if 
<laughs> if the Lord our God comes and says, hey, we want to use you for a holy cause and you say yes, then, well, you're fighting on the side of light and goodness, right? If, if But there's also going to be people who say, oh, these are dangerous people. We want them on our side to not maintain the order of things. So there's going to be all kinds of people who are interested in free agents, uh, especially of the power of dungeon fantasy role-playing game characters, which are more like six to tenth level D and D guys. They they start strong. Nice. So these 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 are movers and shakers as they walk up to the town. So they're going to very much be the fulcrum around which a lot of things can turn. All right. It's like an NFL player deciding that they're free agency, right? Yeah, that's if they're good. It's important. Uh, th this is yeah. This is meant for people who have leveled up and and they want to make a name for themselves and 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 actually take some power for themselves. That's great. That's great. Um, so we are almost out of time. So uh, just like Daddy Warpig said, you've got that. Uh, we've got the Indiegogo or not the the Kickstarter rather link. Uh, in the description, so you can check that out. That sounds like going to be a big supplement. Um, I wanted to, to, I wanted to bring it home to actual gaming uh, at the table for you guys, because because uh, you guys have a lot of experience as game masters. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a classic problem. Uh, I was recently playing a game of of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, yes, the dreaded fifth edition, uh, and we we had uh, the classic scenario come up of a group stealth roll. Uh, now the conditions weren't favorable for, for stealth. I, I won't describe the whole scenario, but uh, so failure was likely. Uh, but we uh, we did the, the thing that, that comes up a lot where everybody in the group rolled stealth, uh, which naturally guaranteed failure, uh, particularly from the unstealthy guys, which is kind of expected. But uh, most of the players found that pretty you know, unsatisfactory about that. And 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 I I termed it uh, rolling to failure, uh, which is a term I picked up from from a, an OSR blog uh, in the past. Uh, and it fits the situation. So uh, my question to you guys is, uh, if, if if you're familiar with the situation, uh, what's what do you recommend or 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 was the situation handled properly, or or is there a better way to do it in in D and D or any system? Uh, we'll start with you, Doug. Okay, um, you know I think that part of it is playing to strengths and weaknesses. If if you're in fifth edition, you've got a bunch of people who are proficient at stealth, and then you've got a bunch of people who are not proficient at stealth. Uh, the players have a choice; they have an agency enabling decision, if you must say it that way. Um, either they're going to try and make the entire party stealthy, in which case, yeah, either the lowest stealth roll rolls or they all do. And they say, who's, you know, you see who steps on the branch, uh, or they say stealthy people go forward, non-stealthy people wait till contact is made. And, and so there, there's a decision there that was made to say, well, the, the non-stealthy people are going to sneak. Uh, if it's inevitable, then, well, yeah, you know, I mean, moving, moving in the wilderness is hard. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other is, is you know, frequently so that you don't spend all the time rolling, you'll say, okay, well, we're going to roll against the average skill at disadvantage because we've got people who are untrained. That's another way to do it. Um, so in Dragon Heresy, there is a mechanic kicking around somewhere where I had worked out the probabilities of groups and large groups rolling at advantage and disadvantages. And you basically change the difficulty class when you've got a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing being told how to move by people who do. Um, but, you know, I, I think in the particular question, when every single person really does need to be good because one mistake gives it away, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's certainly one way to do it. I mean, if you don't want everybody rolling... You just focus on, you know, maybe the the best stealth guy and then the worst. Uh, no, that makes sense. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. I, and and uh, it wasn't so much not wanting everybody to roll, but uh, and I haven't done the math. You're the math guy. Uh, even if everybody were good at stealth, forcing, for example, six stealth rolls, that's that's going to generate a failure. If if yeah, you're well, if you're rolling six times and taking uh, the lowest, right? The weakest link. 
you're absolutely right. And that's where group roles, you say, okay, well, we're going to roll against the average skill. Everyone's proficient. So we're going to roll the average skill, but at advantage, or we're going to just roll the, you know, the highest skill, the lowest skill at, oh, actually that would be better. If everyone's proficient, roll the lowest skill once, but at advantage because everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that would be, so, so you definitely favor sort of a, a, a way of mixing the roles so, so that you take into account the fact that, not everybody's good at it or, or not everybody's as good at it, but without guaranteeing failure on the multiple. Right. I, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, I, I, I ran into this in Lost Hall of Tear because I was going to try and use the grappling rules to simulate mountain climbing. And I worked it out in my hotel room. I'm like, this is great. And then I went and started playing and I got to this situation and I'm like, wow. I have eight or nine people around my table and I'm about to ask each of them to make 10 rolls. I am an evil bastard. And so I abandoned my plan and said, uh, let's you make. And then as it turned out, that particular group said, we're just going to send the thief up to do the climbing. And so it became one person anyway. But the point is, is that you never want a situation where is you got seven people looking at their watches and rolling dice and watch the game as the game master stares down at his books. Yeah. Just not fun. Right. Yeah, that, that, um, that's a good point. Daddy Warpig, what's your take? Um, actually, the solution I just came up with, I can't talk about it on the air um, because it's, it's peculiar to the project and, uh, uh, so I, you know, can talk about it after. after. You, 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 had a you have a mechanic in mind, but it's it's still in R and D. It's classified. Uh, no, I mean I literally thought of it just right now, like in the last three minutes. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's a brand new mechanic. Now my suggestion was this, and it's it's not necessarily directly affecting your question about stealth. But it's a bit of game master advice that came up in the last couple of weeks based on playing a lot of video games where stealth is an important factor. Um, is specifically most recently the three Metro games. I played through Metro 2033, Metro Last Light, and uh, Metro Exodus. So let me present to you a quick situation and then explain how you could use this as a game master to set up a framework to make stealth uh, much more interesting and much less dependent on roles. So you have to sneak around a building. And we'll assume for the purposes of this discussion, it's an abandoned warehouse and the windows have gotten knocked loose. Somebody's hit them with rocks or something. And there's a bunch of ground along the side. And then on the other side, there's some shrubs. So the players, if they're trying to sneak around the warehouse, they have, we'll say, for the, again, for the sake of this discussion, two choices. One is they can do the hard thing and avoid the glass, but walk along that path, which uh, is difficult, but it's really hard to see them from the warehouse because there's no, you know, all the windows are boarded up. It's hard to see them out that side. So as long as they don't step on glass, they'll be okay. Or they could choose to take the easier route and walk, you know, just behind the bushes. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's not going to give them, that's not going to give them an outcome that is, um, that's a huge bonus. The point I'm trying to make is describe the situation as it exists in the game world and have consequences for um, success and failure. For example, the shrubs might make things easier for newbies, but not provide a lot of bonuses to really experienced people. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is you could switch up these bonuses all the time so that they offer different, uh, different incentives, incentives, exactly. Different benefits for success, different, uh, difficulties for failure. So you describe the world 
you base the incentives on what you described and then you let the players make the choice you know don't tell them the incentives necessarily just keep those to yourself but you let the players make the choice based on the world and then you can tell them inform them okay well as a game master the way i see it is this part it's harder to see you so the guards don't get a roll perception but you know if you fail you're going to make a lot of noise this other part um, the guards will get to roll perception, but it's a lot easier because you have a lot more cover, especially from onlookers. Okay. You describe the world in concrete terms. You assign bonuses and penalties to the options that you're giving the player, and then you allow the players to make a decision based on the realities of the world. So it moves stealth from a realm of sheer dice rules into a realm of assessing the environment and making choices based on that environment. And your player characters may surprise you. They may be, they may say, but wait a minute. Um, what about that ladder there? Is it really rusty? And for the sake of discussion, you'll say, well, no, actually they just put it up. It's brand new because they put it up to board over the windows. And they'll say, okay, so that ladder isn't rusty. Therefore, there's no, there's not a good chance it'll squeak, right? And, and you as game master say, no, you're right. And they say, okay, well, we want to take that ladder and do something creative with it. Okay, so your players are thinking about the game world in terms of what uh, its description and actuality and objects are like. That means they're engaged in your game world and it seems more real and more visceral to them. They're not thinking in terms of numbers. They're thinking in terms of movement and what order they go in and things like that. So all of that combines to make it a role-playing opportunity, to make it a tactical opportunity to choose the right tactical move to sneak around or into this building, which again will engage more of their mind, get them more thinking about the game, and it's just more interesting. I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate game masters who say, okay, we've got to do X, Y, and Z, roll stealth. Or when you say, okay, we want to get across her, and all they say is roll stealth, roll stealth, roll stealth, roll stealth. No. No. Never, 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 never. Describe the player, describe the situation, give the players an in-game choice, consequences for that choice, and your players will engage with the game world rather than the game mechanics. The game will be more entertaining. It isn't complicated. You don't have to write a novel. You can just say, you know, the uh, trees are really, th the, the branches of the trees are really thick here, and there is a, just a tiny little bit of moonlight that comes through them, and it's very dark underneath them. And on the other side, there's a bunch of glass around, and the windows are boarded over, uh, and you can see you know, and maybe you toss it in just off the top of your head. You can see the glint of a ladder up against the warehouse. Okay. I, I love it. And and I I think you mentioned something like this earlier when talking about incentives and, and advantages and things. You're, you're not saying keep the game mechanics out of it. You can still say something like, uh, you'll probably have advantage going on this route, but on this other route, uh, you might, you know, you might decrease your risk of getting shot or something like that. Or Or, or if you do fail, you'll get a second chance. Right, okay. So, so you're not saying hide the game mechanics, you're just saying uh, make it about that game world that they want to interact with first. Right, right. And, and, I, and I think, so I, I, I really, really agree um, with a lot of what you said. Um, and the, the key to me, I think, is that the, the dice are there to resolve uncertainty that cannot be resolved any other way. I'm going to swing my sword at this creature. Well, you know, there's a reason why they say if, you know, oh, if you sneak up on somebody and they're sleeping, you don't roll to, well, some people roll to hit. I don't, I wouldn't say roll to hit. I might say roll damage to see if it lopped their head off in one blow or not. Um, but the dice are there to resolve uncertainty. At, as almost as a last resort, but to, to, to make it so that you can't just know exactly what's going to happen. It's not deterministic, but they're not there to provide a substitute for interesting play. 
Right. They're, they're there to make the play that's interesting uncertain so that there's risk reward, right? So saying, yeah, I mean, having the, the route is a great example. I go left and I have to make an easy stealth roll, but then it makes the combat more challenging. I go right and the stealth roll is harder, well, but the combat might go you start basically from behind. You get a, a free exactly. shot, a surprise round or something, right? And then you get into something where everyone's action matters in a second by second. But, you know, you don't need to belabor the point. And, and I think that any time that you're effectively metagaming, you're playing the mechanics of the game, not the situation, then you run the risk of... Uh, Alienating is the wrong word, but there's going to be people who are bored with that yes. and really want everyone. The best game is when you got six or seven people or four, you know, three to seven people leaning forward and they can't wait to see what's happening next. But if someone's like, oh, I need to make 32 dice rolls anywhere between what did I just say? Anywhere between three and seven people, anywhere between two and six people are going to be sitting back and saying, oh, my God. And, you know, especially on online games, even the person doing the dice rolling is going to be surfing on in the second window. Yeah, and don't play online. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. For for the secret project, it's as I've said before, it's stories and a role playing game um, that share a game world. For the role playing game, my entire approach to my game master advice. The approach that I want to teach game masters, and then I'm developing as I develop the game, because it's not an approach, and I'm not saying it isn't taught anywhere else. It's not at all an approach that I've seen taught to game masters in the games I've played. My entire approach is to encourage the game master, first and foremost, to describe the world, allow players to make choices based on what they see or sense or think about the world and then describe to them the results of their actions after they did the dice rolling. The dice rolling only comes in at step three and after step three, we're back to description again. So the dice rolling, and I'm not one of those anti-dice rolling zealots. You'll roll when you need it. You don't roll when you don't. But as a game master, you can train yourself to think of the world in terms of uh, concrete readily identifiable descriptions, communicate that to the players as clearly as you can, and there'll be problems, and then draw the players into the reality of that world. And that gives you the strongest possible foundation to build tension and to build involvement and to build enjoyment because players will react to the concrete nature of your world. They will see it more clearly in their minds. They'll feel more invested in it, and it'll make your games more compelling just by doing very small things. And, and I was just about to say, uh, if, if you take the opposite attitude the, the, that Douglas Cole described about just rolls, 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 you end up doing what... Uh, what Bradford Walker always calls mech piloting. You're just like, I, I, this is how I interact with the world. I interact with the world with this menu of skills, and I, I just push this button and I roll these dice. So you're asking about stealth. That's my thought about stealth. Is it's not directly in response to your question about rolling as a group or not, but it's like, how do we make stealth itself more intrinsically interesting so that the role itself is minimized in importance? Give the players options, let those options have consequences, describe them. And and they'll be, I believe they'll be more engaged in the yes. game world itself. And that's what you want. You want them actually engaged. Right. Yep. Ab absolutely. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's it's not a choose your own adventure book and it's and it's not a scripted event, right? You want it to you want it to be spontaneous. You want it to be interesting. You want people to say, hey, you know, I'd rather spend four or five hours with this group of people than watching a movie or, or hitting refresh on Twitter or whatever, right? You want it to be something that feels like, why would I ever choose to do anything else but this with this group of people? Amen. Amen. So we're way over time, but I'm glad that we did because that was a really interesting discussion. Chat loved it too.
uh, Douglas Cole, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on again. I'll give you another chance to to talk about your your new project and everything before we say goodnight. Now, <laughs> so so I, I first I really do appreciate you guys having me on repeatedly. I, I love the show. I love talking about it. Um, talking about you know a, a couple hours spent talking about gaming is is one of my favorite things ever. Um, the Citadel at Nordvorn is my first real setting as opposed to a quest or an adventure. Uh, it's steeped in uh, simplified or not modernized, but it's, it's steeped in bits of tangible and visceral Viking culture uh, taken from the sagas, taken from mythology. Um, it encourages you to be bold um, and to do great things against really long odds that could get you killed and eaten. So it's really a classic uh, web of adventure that really should let you um, play heroic characters heroically, but in a setting that isn't just plywood, or at least I'd like to think so. So I, I think that there's gonna be some depth there. Uh, I think the background uh, will really come to life uh, during during play, um, but it is going to be up to the game master and the players to make it interesting, uh, because you're not going off after the uh, the holy cup of war pig, um, but that really needs to be in there somehow. Um, I think I'm going to make an entire adventure based on the holy cup of war pig, awesome. because on, well, because the fun thing is is that boars, the wild pigs, are a sacred animal in Viking culture, right? I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, um, you could have a whole I, plan, right? With one, one of Frey's animals was a boar, a boar and a stag. So, I mean, it ties directly into the mythology. So, I mean, having the cup of the war pig is absolutely something that could show up in the mythos, in the mythology. That's sweet. That's awesome. Right? I mean, that's the thing. And I really want to say this. Vikings have sort of been done to death in pop culture. Because you've got Skyrim, I mean. Well, there's Skyrim. There's the Vikings show. There's yeah. Last uh, uh, Last Kingdom. Um, but one of the things that I don't think has been done in a truly epic way is to rediscover the glory and fun that is the old Viking saga culture. Because, like, here's a great example. If I'm going to get married, I need to go into a barrow and reclaim an ancestral sword to give as a present to my intended. So in order to become a proper Viking man, to marry, to have children and all that stuff, I need to go on a freaking dungeon delve, face my ancestors, and if I piss them off, they become a Draugr or, or a Vator, and they rise up and kill me because I'm not worthy. I mean, it, you have to be a dungeon delver in order to get freaking married. <laughs> what better game, <laughs> what better setting is there for a fantasy role-playing game than one where the fundamental rights of, of maturity are basically, hey, go on a dungeon delve. You don't even have to make up a reason to go on this delve. That's it, it, it's just awesome. <laughs> and every time I read something new, I'm like, oh my God, that's so gameable. I, I'm just, and just hearing your passion about it, I'm really excited to see this project take off. Yeah, I, I, I confess, I thought I had already put in it uh, on the Kickstarter, and it turns out I hadn't, but I did that during the show. And you were the one who brought us within a couple bucks of 50%, so thank you. Right. Nice going. Oh, and we're over 50%. Yay! Great way to end the show. That, that that's awesome. The, uh, your your excitement for the project is infectious. I really like it. Um, but yeah, thank thank you so much for coming on. Uh, well, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to send both of you guys the laid out preview because it's worth seeing and looking at. You know, it's 105 pages long, but you can see what it's going to be. Oh yeah, yeah. That, I, I'd love to see that. Uh, Daddy Warpig, thanks for joining as always with your expertise and and wisdom. Any last words for us? Um, we are probably going to be doing a show at our regularly, or what used to be our regularly scheduled time on Saturday. 
Yeah, jump in, hang out with us live on Saturday. That's usually at 11 a.m. Pacific, so 2 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, I think that's what we were doing. Yeah, we'll do something like that this weekend. Follow DW on Twitter. He'll get you all the information. Right. Um, uh, as for me, a uh, big thank you to you guys for joining me for tonight. And lots of love for the chat, uh, who uh, uh, really excited about all the new stuff in RPGs. And uh, and they really liked you guys' takes on stealth and dice rolls and, and immersion and, and all that. That was really interesting to them. So thanks for hanging out, guys. Uh, if you want to uh, join us live, on, we're on YouTube, youtube.com slash geekgab. If you want to get notifications, you please subscribe to us. Click the bell so that you get your email notifications. You can also follow Daddy Warpig on Twitter. That's the best way to get notifications on Twitter. Uh, uh, our guest Douglas Cole's on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. All that stuff's in, our, in, in the show notes on YouTube. Uh, we usually put our... Uh, podcasts up on SoundCloud, uh, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, we should be there. Just search for Geek Gap, and we'd love to have you as, as listeners. But that's it for tonight. I'm John signing off on behalf of Daddy War Pig uh, and Geek Gap. This has been Geek Gap Game Night for Thursday, February 21th. Thanks for listening in. Good night and game on. <laughs>